It's like, okay, this is interesting. And I just remember thinking, is there more to life than this? And I remember I put up a little, a little post, uh, printed a little text on a sheet of paper and I put it up on my, the wall of my cubicle and it said, um, living the dream or like just another day in paradise, like these motivational things, right? <laughs> and I just remember thinking, is this the dream? Is, is my passion in life IT project management? Welcome to the Passion Struck Podcast. My name is John Miles, a former combat veteran and multi-industry CEO turned entrepreneur and human performance expert. Each week we showcase an inspirational person or message that helps you unlock your hidden potential and unleash your creativity and leadership abilities. Thank you for joining us today on the show and let's get igniting. Welcome to the Passion Struck Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Jim Highsmith, one of the original signers of the Agile Manifesto said, agility is the ability to adapt and respond to change. Agile organizations view change as an opportunity and not a threat. Esther Derby said, when we are blind to systematic causes of problems, all the solutions we try will likely make matters worse. And I think these are a great backdrop to our guest today, Maria Mattarelli. I think you are absolutely going to love her message. We are going to talk about her rise to her passion journey and the obstacles she had to overcome to reach her journey of becoming a serial entrepreneur. You are not going to want to miss this episode. But let me tell you a little bit more about Maria. Maria is an international business consultant, experienced agile coach, and certified scrum trainer who consults and trains companies on reaching through agility. Maria travels to consult with Fortune 100 companies and speaks at industry conferences from Shanghai to Singapore and all the way to Nova Scotia and in between. While looking for ways to continue to expand outside of IT, she began exploring ways to take agility into marketing and by doing so, co-founded the Agile Marketing Academy. Maria also co-founded the Personal Agility Institute, helping people use Agile to do more of what matters in their own lives. And she is the founder and president of Formula Link, an international consulting company, and is passionate about working with people and organizations to increase speed to market, increase efficiency, and get better results from businesses. I am so excited to have Maria in the house. Thank you so much for joining us today, Maria, on the Passion Struck Podcast. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Maria, I am so excited to have you with us today. And I remember when I first met you a number of years ago, I was totally blown away by your confidence, your presence, and just how much knowledge you had to share. And I think the listeners are going to want to hear so much of what you have to say today. And I'd like to start out by having you start telling them what your life was like before you started your passion journey. I think you were in industry at the time. And can you give them a glimpse of what was happening at that point in your life? John, I appreciate this question. It's always fun to go back down that trail of memory lane. I remember, you know, I remember working in an office and I remember thinking, is this my life? Is this cubicle my future? Like, is this all that there is? <laughs> And you know, to back up a little bit, I started working when I was 15 and I worked three jobs to pay my way through college. And if I didn't do that, I wasn't going to go. And so when I got into the corporate workforce, I already had years of experience from that. So you're talking about insurance. I was working at State Farm Insurance Corporate Headquarters, Systems yes. Technology Department, and running uh, IT projects, project management, managing $5 million projects a year, early 20s. And I remember just thinking, man, I'm done with my work halfway through the week because I just, I felt like I, I really took to project management. It's very clear cut. It's efficient. It's like plan out the work and then do the plan, right? And like, make sure you're on track. And I just always loved that type of type of work. But I realized like I was done with my job like halfway through the week. And then I'd have to sit there on site and I'd have to like clock the hours. So I'm like, okay, well, what else? And so then they load me up with projects. Now I've got seven projects. And I'm like, barely can get through the day, meeting to meeting to meeting. It's like, okay, this is interesting. And I just remember thinking, is there more to life than this? And I remember I put up a little, a little post, uh, printed a little text on a 
sheet of paper and I put it up on my the wall of my cubicle and it said um living the dream or like just another day in paradise like these motivational things right <laughs> and I just remember thinking is this the dream is is my passion in life IT project management and the answer I came back with was maybe not and I remember I always yearned for more and one of the things that I did is I wasn't sure what to do. And you know, even for those listening that are trying to think, well, what's my passion? Or I wanna get out of my job and start you know, something that I'm really excited about. I always say, you know, you don't have to know everything. And this is, this is agile right here, right? You don't have to know everything. You just gotta be willing to take a step. And even if you're, that step isn't to the end zone, it's a step forward. And then take another step and pivot if you need to. And so I actually started by speaking at conferences. And that's how I got out into the market to where people started to know who I was. Um, I started doing agile project management. And what was interesting is a lot of the people I worked with, they didn't want to change. So they just wanted to manage all their projects in the traditional method they'd always done. They didn't want to do anything different. They didn't want to learn a new methodology. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to become an expert in this thing that nobody else seems to want to learn. And I took that upon myself. And what really was that first step out into that entrepreneurship type of um, realm was when I started speaking at these conferences and that started to get me out in the industry. I, I just thought, I think in order to get ahead, you have to do something more than just the bare minimum. You can't just do your job. Right. And then from there, I branched off into launching a company, launching multiple companies. Um, and the rest is sort of history from there. Maria, you bring me so much down memory lane. And I remember my own journey to find agile methodology and how to apply it. And I was working at the time at Lowe's and I had just taken over the software development organization. And we had a large team, 2,500 to 3,000 developers, and we're running about 300 different projects a year, but all of them were using Waterfall. And I remember us having all these different delays. And it was like, by the time we got the product delivered, we had lost so much of the momentum. And as I was getting into my job, I had an interview with one of my really good friends, Scott Butterfield, who at that time was the SVP over business strategy. And I remember him telling me this to this very day. He said, John, you know, we are absolutely amazing at delivering solutions that by the time they go to market are absolutely obsolete. And that quote completely changed my mind and direction on how I needed to lead that organization and the fix I needed to put in place. And that is when I went out and got trained in Agile, found a business customer, my friend to this day, Ron Lutz, who took the journey with me. And we applied Agile in that first project and completely changed the trajectory of how software development would be done in the future at Lowe's. So with that as a backdrop, I wanted to find out how did you know that this was the right thing to do on your passion journey? And what gave you the inspiration to take it in that direction? Such a good question. So yeah, if you think, oh, I wanna do something more, but you're, you're like, what is actually the point that makes you take that step, right? That pushes you forward to doing it. Um, I remember when I graduated college, I worked as um, worked in an internship, worked as a college undergrad, um, worked at another very large Fortune 100 company out of college. And when I went over to work in the, the company that I ended up going with, State Farm, I remember that I had another job offer on the table and it was actually for $10,000 more, which when you're first coming out of college, that's a lot of money. Right. And so I was like, Oh, wow, cool. But for a variety of reasons, I wanted to go with the second option and get more into the project management. Um, and so as I did, I remember they told me, they were like, well, here's what this job pays. And it was $10,000 less. And they said, well, Maria, if you do a really good job, a really good job. You're really hard. We can see if we can get you up to that, right? But you just have to really show us that you can produce that value. Right. So my first projects were the enterprise server release, Windows Unix server upgrades. And basically it was a $3 million portfolio. And once a year we did two releases and we went from two releases to three, streamlined the projects and we were able to offshore the work to other people overseas and free up our onsite people for more strategic work, which was a passive residual cost savings of $1.5 million. I was 22 years old managing those projects. So I'm saving the company one and a half million dollars a year. And what happened is when I went in for my performance review a year later, and I had a, I had a stack of documents of all kinds of accolades and people saying, thank you. And oh, what a great job I did because I thought, oh, I'm supposed to make this case, right? That's what they told me. And they changed the game. They changed the rules on me. And they were like, oh, 
Maria, we just put a new policy in place. You can only get maximum 5%, but great news, you qualified for the 5%. John, I did the math. It would take me 10 years at 5% increase every year to get down to the job I turned down the year before. And that's when I realized the system was broken and it wasn't going to work for me. And so I was furious. I felt betrayed. I felt lied to. I was, right? And so I go back to my desk and I was just like, how do I make sure this isn't going to happen to me again? I cannot trust the system. It's not working. And what I did is I worked even harder the next year. And I did even better on my projects, you know, right? We try to manage them within timeline and budget and, you know, to have a successful launch on whatever project it is. And I went out in the industry and I interviewed. Because here's the other thing. I, I discovered all the people around me, they were making like double my salary. And I'm like, how are they making like this? I mean, some people just even 30, 40, $50,000 more than me. And I'm like, what are they even doing? They're managing two projects in maintenance mode, like, like service work. Like they're literally attending a status meeting once a week and updating it. And I'm planning out these like hundreds of line items with 120 people on my team, intricately like predecessor, successor, like all of this stuff. And I'm like, how am I managing seven projects, saving the company millions of dollars a year and then getting 5%? That's, that doesn't work for me. And so what I did is I worked very diligently and I started saying, well, what would my value be in the actual industry outside of these walls? And so I interviewed with multiple companies. I actually had three job offers lined up on the table the following year. So when I walked into my performance review, they're like, oh, congratulations, Ray. You did an excellent job. You get your 5% raise, you know, pat on the back, pat on the head. And I was like, oh yeah, about that. I was like, that's not gonna work for me because I know what my skill levels in the industry. And just because they hired me in here, like they wanted to inch me up from there, but I'm like, but my skill level is actually here, right? Like it's way greater than what you're thinking. And so I said to them, I was like, I would like for you to match these offers. And it was about double my salary. They're like, Maria, there's no way we can jump you up that much. That's just not how this works. I'm like, okay, cool. Let me know if you want me to put in my two weeks notice or if you want to escort me off the client site today. And I walked out of the room, went back to my desk. Within 10 minutes, they called me to come back to the conference room and they said, so we kind of need you to train all of our new people. And um, we really don't want to tell, because as through an external vendor, we don't want to tell external staffing that you're not renewing because they think that you are. And so I was like, okay, well, you're going to have to match this. And they said, well, we can't get you that in a salary, but we can give you this base plus two large bonuses spread throughout the year. And if we do that with you training the new people, we can get you very close. I said, thank you. I'd like to take 48 hours to think about it. Like, no, we need an answer today. I was like, yeah, but I'm pretty sure everyone else gets 48 hours. And so I'm, I'm going to let you know Monday. And I walked out and I ended up renewing. Why? Because I had just planned out all my projects and they were all in maintenance mode. I already did most of the work. And I thought, you know what? I'm comfortable here, but like, let me see what else I can do to grow. And they were able to meet pretty much my, my request. And John, it, like where this came from was it came from a place, and I think this is something for all entrepreneurs and people that finally take that leap for their passion. This was just like a baby step of seeing what I could do to push against the system, right? This is before I went out on my own, but it was a turning point because I was like, wait a minute, I can change the rules of the game. I can take more risk. And without the risk, you don't get the reward. And so it comes right. from not having anything to lose. So what I did is I stacked the deck so I wasn't afraid. If they said, okay, great, you're done here. Great, let me pack up my desk. Okay, I, got, I literally had the offers on the table. So like similarly, so I stayed there a couple more years, trained up all the new people, became the go-to agilist, like the person who was like the agile expert, led lunch and learns, did coaching with other teams. And, you know, at one point I was, I realized, you know, I do want more. It still wasn't like enough of what I felt I was capable of. And so I started off by speaking at conferences and getting out in the industry to build my name, build my brand before actually venturing out to start my own business. And that was a pretty good runway. Maria, that is such an amazing story, but I wanted to understand, and I'm sure the listeners want to understand, when you took that first step, what was it like? Did you feel skeptical? Were you afraid? You know, were you excited? Were you anxious? What was it like when you took that first step and decided on this new path? How did you feel? So what happened was, this is actually, it's not even that straightforward. Um, I was hungry. I was hungry for opportunity. And so I actually was talking with an organization and they were a global organization and I had an opportunity to do some consulting with them. And so I went and um, like talked to them, but I didn't know how to pitch it. So I went to a friend of mine who had a consulting company and I was like, Hey, um, can, can you help me with this? And so he helped me put it together. 
and we put the proposal and went through his company. And I ended up actually working two jobs for almost a year. I was a project manager full time and a scrum master for you know half the projects. And then I was literally in the morning checking email over lunch, checking email, and then working from 5 p.m. to like midnight every night for about half a year to almost a year. Um, and so I was actually stacking additional work on top of it. So when I was working with this consulting company, I was starting to get the experience. I actually didn't jump out on my own because I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to write a proposal. I didn't know. And what I realized, John, is that I had been working in a J-O-B so long that I had lost original thought. Like my ability to have original thought was gone. I was so used to people telling me exactly what to do, follow the uh, you know, solution development methodology, and you go through the phase gate approach, and this, that, the other. You know, using the Scrum framework, and so it actually took a couple of years to like get my mind honed into thinking like an entrepreneur. So I ended up quitting my day job as a project manager and Scrum master because um, I ran out of vacation time, and I had an opportunity to go to an event in California, and I'd never been there, and I kind of wanted to do that, so I put in two weeks. And so I actually spent the next several years working with this other boutique consultancy. Now, the challenge was that, you know, I was working for someone else still. So I was being told, hey, maximize your time with the client site. I sold a quarter million dollar contract to a client in Chicago, and I was doing all the work, and I was making just a fraction of the actual billable hours. And so that's where I started ramping up speaking at conferences. And I was like, well, let me get, let me get myself out there in the industry more. And as I did that, I had less billable hours, right? So the, the person I was working with was like, no, Maria, you need to bill all the hours. I'm like, well, you're not on site with the client. Why am I bringing in all the money? And so we ended up having a difference in sort of vision. And I wanted to do more inspirational stuff and work with entrepreneurs. And I wanted to you know, do something more thought leadership. And he's like, no, go on site and just make money and just coach and consult. And so I ended up stepping out on my own. And John, when I did that, um, it was one of those things where it was not a smooth transition. I went negative in my bank account three times over the next year, trying to figure out how to get my business started. And it was not easy. And it took me over a year to figure out how to even do it. So I think those are great points. And the more I interview people, the more I interact with people, I am convinced that people are getting stuck today by the contagions in our world. And like I always like to say, I don't mean the pandemic. I'm talking the contagions of the human mind and the human spirit and the fact that people value showmanship over showing up. Why do apathy and the comfort zone play such a big role today? And why are fewer and fewer people truly doing what they want to do, creating businesses and being the entrepreneurs that I know you all can be? It is so usual for us to go through hardships to have to go through obstacles, to have to go to what feels like quicksand to reach the next level. And Maria, I wanted to ask you, what were those hurdles and obstacles you had to come over? And what did it feel like when you were going down that path? I like blindly fumbled forward is the best <laughs> way I can describe it. I did learn from the first boutique consultancy I worked with. Um, but when I went out on my own, I, I really, I didn't know what I was doing. I fumbled forward. Like if you fail and fall forward, at least you're making some kind of progress, right? At least you see what doesn't work. So I was like, wanting to do, okay, let me do training, right? Project management training, agile training, but I didn't really niche down. So I'm like, oh yeah, I can help businesses, consult entrepreneurs, but it wasn't like, it was like kind of too broad, right? And so what I realized is that I needed to niche down and get something very specific. So I was like, okay, let me go into project management consulting, specifically agile project management, specifically the scrum framework, specifically a certification around that. And so like, that's actually a niche. And you know what they say, the niches are, the riches are in the niches. So, you know, when you niche down, that's where you get the, the results, the profitability, because you can really connect with that ideal customer, right? I mean, basic marketing. And so when I got very specific on who I was trying to serve and exactly what value, now in order to do that, it actually took me four years to get certified to teach these certification classes. So it wow. was definitely a journey. It was the feedback I got, like I, I failed the, the TAC review the first time I went through it. And I questioned, it was such harsh feedback I got. I questioned if I should ever speak in public again. True story. It was harsh. Like they're like, ah, you're not ready. This and that. Do you even know this stuff? And it was just insulting. And I just remember thinking, okay, so I failed. 
And now what? But I really thought like that was a niche I was really good at. I mean, my most effective agile project was uh, we we're doing a website migration project and there was a vendor we were working with. There were 50 other identical organizations to the one I was working with that had already used the same vendor. And we ended up using an agile approach. We got to market more than 80% faster than 50 other organizations identical to ours. And wow. the variable of the vendor was the same. And so that's literally just the difference between traditional project management and using agile. And I knew I could get results. So I knew I was good at it, right? How do you streamline a $3 million project to 1.5 million every, like, annual cost savings as in, in your early 20s? You understand how it works, right? And so when I got denied for the certification, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And there was a couple of friends of mine, a couple other trainers in the industry that are like, Maria, don't you give up. And they listened to me. They listened to me complain and talk about how unjust the world was, right? And I just appreciate them so much for being supportive and just saying, hey, just keep going. You can do this, right? So I think having a little bit of a support system can help. Uh, but really, I mean, it was one of those things where I was like, I think I need to niche down. Here's a niche that I think will be lucrative. And in order to get certified, I had to fly around the U.S. and co-train with existing certified trainers. I mean, it was probably minimum $20,000 or more of cost just out of pocket to go and do that. Like it was not easy, but I really had done my research. I had the expertise and experience and I knew I just needed to prove it. I needed to show it. And the second time, <laughs> funny story, John, it's like, it's like one of those things where you're in like a, a, a car, right? And it's like, you're almost out of gas and you see like the little levers like below the E and you're like, how long before below the E do I have? Right. And I was so out of money by this time that I was up for the second review for this group because they made me wait almost a year to go in front of the panel review again. Um, I could not even afford to buy the flight. I couldn't even afford to stay in a hotel. I had a friend of mine actually bought me the flight to fly to New Orleans to actually go in front of the panel review again to try to get certified. I couldn't even afford the hotel. So I actually, I didn't even, I, I flew out, I had a flight at like six, uh, six or 8 a.m. So I stayed up all night. I ended up passing out in like one of the couches in the lobby of the hotel because I couldn't even afford a room. And that's how bad it was. When I got approved, the certification licensing fee was $5,000. I couldn't even afford that. And I had jobs lined up that I couldn't even accept because I had literally gone to the end. I believed so much in what I was doing. It's like I burned the bridge behind me. It was like, this is either going to work or it's not. And it's that persistence that I think really gets you there. And it's believing in what you do and it's, it's getting feedback, it's pivoting, it's finding support, right? And it's not giving up. It's that resilience that you have to have. Yeah, you know, I think absolutely resilience and grit play a huge part of it. But when I'm working with my clients, I try to take them through a six step process. In the first phase, we go through a deep analysis of what are the brutal realities that they're facing in their life. You can listen to more of this in a previous podcast I've already done. And then we go into the next phase, which is once you go through that and you figure out where it is you want to go as your final destination, we have to break it down into steps and then make sure we prioritize because prioritization is one of the most critical things you can do. And then you have to ignite it. You have to cultivate it. You have to commit to it. And once you do that, the most important thing is to take action and to execute and to execute every day, to focus on those inputs that get you farther along the road to your output and then measure them and measure them again and then renew and do it all over again. You see, that is my own personal agility process that I use with clients every day of the week. And it's something you can apply in your own life too. So I know you have your own personal agility process that you use. And I wanted you to tell the audience, so once you've reached this point, how do you stay on top of it? What tricks do you have to share with them? Over the years, um, it's, looking, it's having clarity on where you're gonna go, right? It's being willing to put in the work. And one of my goals was to be a global consultancy. And so I was like, I would like to be uh, someone that consults companies of all sizes and global, like around the world. And so you have to, again, take risk. Every time you step forward, there's risk to be taken, but it's also, there's a reward on the other side if you do it right, right? So like, can you do calculated risks? So for me, interestingly enough, when I was in Chicago, 
Um, I, my consulting contract came to a close and I didn't renew it. I left the other consultancy and that's when I had like a year to try to figure it out. And I took me like a very stumbly year, right? And in that time, I remember my apartment in Chicago was up for renewal for the lease and they're trying to jack up my rent. And I'm living downtown Michigan Avenue, top floor overlooking the Lake Michigan. Oh. So I was there and I remember thinking, you know, for me to do what I want to do, I had the clarity of vision of what I wanted, but I just realized I had too many constraints. So instead of renewing my lease, I actually just let it expire. I started selling my things. I got one storage unit and I started traveling. I started traveling on one-way tickets. And so as I was traveling, um, I'd like go speak in a conference here or over there. It, what I found was it opened up a world of opportunity because I took away needing to be in Chicago, having to pay thousands of dollars every month for rent. Like I took more risk as well. So um, I ended up to Shanghai, Singapore, Thailand, India, throughout the US, just one way tickets. And I actually did that for five years. Now that's a little extreme and I don't necessarily recommend that, but what it did was it allowed me to create these global connections, a global network. And so I was speaking at all these conferences. Then I started leading training classes, had partners in other countries. And then from there, um, it just kind of started to take off because I put in the legwork. I was making those connections and I was delivering the value and then getting hired back. Maria, that is such a fascinating story. And one of the things that I think you have inside of you, which those who are passion struck truly possess, is you are a mission angler. And what I mean by that is you had the courage to do something great. You mustered that internal power to do something that was going to take you so much further in your career than where you were stuck at. And I applaud you for doing that. And I think your example is one that so many of our listeners can use as inspiration because making that decision to do something more, to figure out the angle you want for your mission to be is so important on your journey. So you mustered that power, you executed on it. How did you know when you had finally succeeded and what did that feel like? I think, I think it was, I'm trying to think if there was one defining moment and I'm not sure if there was, there, there might've been a series of them. So, okay. you know, I went to Johannesburg, South Africa to lead a training class for Microsoft, uh, led training for IBM in seven locations across multiple countries. Um, you know, speaking at a conference in Singapore, keynoting, and then leading a training class and flying to, to India and Portugal. And, you know, when you, when you look at this type of stuff, I feel like there, there were definitely several moments where I'd be at a conference and speaking in front of thousands of people and they would know who I was by being the speaker. And I'd, you know, walk off stage and all these people knew me, but I didn't know them. And I was like, oh, wow, like that feels good. Like that feels like I'm actually, um, I'm getting the credibility and recognition for all the hard work that I've done. So I'm trying to remember, I don't know if there's one specific moment, but I think it's probably a series of moments of being in those, those events, being at those events where I realized that I was inspiring people and, you know, people reaching out on LinkedIn or sending a follow-up email and just saying, Hey Maria, I, I appreciated your talk on agile marketing or personal agility. And wow, like, here's what I've done in my life. And it's actually given me a positive change. And to me, that makes all the difference. And one of the things I've been focusing on lately is creating case studies. So actually documenting the results that people get with Agile and the results are absolutely incredible. And so there, there's this, this feeling of, I feel validated in what my contribution is to the world and validated in that people see that. They see that value and they see and recognize that you know I have this intrinsic desire that's insatiable to create this, this positive impact and it's starting to happen and it's recognizing that. So I think it's like the, the indicators are other people, feedback from other people that, wow, this was inspiring or because you did that, now I'm doing this. They're like, okay, cool, that was worth it. Did you know that Forbes magazine recently cited that 70% of individuals who do personal development, masterminds and one-on-one -on -one coaching benefited from better work performance increased communication skills and overall better relationships. And we at PassionStruck are obsessed with self-development, coaching, and mentorship. That is why we've created a free resource to help you unlock your hidden potential. Because people doing great things in business and life are just like you, 
only they've had a coach along the way. And we've got that covered too. Let us show you the systems and frameworks that we teach growth-minded individuals to help them step into their sharp edges, execute on their passion journeys, and get predictable results time and time again. Go to passionstruck.com slash coaching right now and let's get igniting. That is awesome. And as I talked about earlier, we use a personal agility process here at PassionStruck. And you came up with the Personal Agility Institute, where you also train clients on how to use Agile to activate and unlock their hidden potential. So I think it would be really valuable for the listeners to hear you discuss your approach to this and why you think Agile can be applied not only in a corporate environment, but to your own personal life. I think the listeners are going to love your answer on this. So it's probably about five years ago. Um, I actually started with just exploring Agile outside of IT. Could you apply Agile in other arenas? So we started with applying it to marketing and looking at what are the results you can get of Agile outside of software development, because that's where a lot of people are familiar with it, right? Works really well for large complex projects. But when you look at um, other applications, it also works really, really well. So the first thing was with looking at Agile applied to marketing, it's like, okay, cool. We can get way more return on the dollars spent in ads by using the same technique. Uh, first client we worked with, we got over 300% increased revenue in six months, over 780% increased revenue in a year. So it's like, okay, oh. cool. Like that's new. That's, that's exciting. And so Nick Cementa and I, we co-founded the Agile Marketing Academy. And that's when I started traveling and teaching Agile marketing around the world, Europe, Asia, throughout the US. Uh, we led a class for McDonald's in Shanghai. We had, uh, their, it was at their office there. And then with Capital One in DC, we had people from Capital One that attended. And it's like, okay, so people are recognizing this. And so then it was a little bit after that, that I ran into another trainer from Switzerland named Peter Stevens. And he was talking about this concept of agile in your life. And I'm like, yeah, Peter, of course you can apply agile in your life. Of course it's going to get results. We all know that. And he's like, yeah, but look at, look at what I've been putting together. And he had this thing that he was calling personal agility. And as we were talking more, I started to realize that it was actually something very powerful, effective, and meaningful. And the reason that Agile is so much more incredible in your life than just in getting business stuff done is because we ask the powerful question, what really matters? And invite people to take a holistic view of everything that's going on in their life and saying, do my actions of what I do every day, are they in alignment with what I say really matters? And can we map those back? And am I on track? And the, the answer is often we get so distracted by stuff. We're just being so reactive, running around busy all the time that we lose sight of that. And it's not just about rinse and repeat and do agile in your life to get more things done. Because I've applied agile to achieve some ridiculous things and successfully, very successfully. But it's like there's a lack of sometimes of what I think is most important and that's happiness and fulfillment. We're so busy chasing achievement and things and like statuses that we forget what really, really matters. And I think it's actually being happy and being fulfilled in the things that we do. Maria, that is so awesome. And I think one of the most important things we can do is to make a personal contract with ourselves. And it's something that I look at every single day. It's where do I want to be a month from now? Where do I want to be a year from now? Where do I want to be five to 10 years from now? And I look at that contract and I think about it every day when I start my morning routine and I go on my walk and I visualize all the things I have to do today to help me accomplish that. What are the inputs that I need to do to make sure that I am moving closer and closer to the dream that I want to accomplish? How do I stay focused on my passion journey? And then when I get home off that walk, I take 10 to 15 minutes and I jot down a list of steps and priorities that I have to do today and the things that matter most for me to accomplish. Because you're right, what happens is we get so distracted in what is urgent. We don't focus on what is important. And I can't make a bigger point about that. So much today is lost because we do what is urgent instead of what is important. We're like a pinball in our own life, just bouncing off of one bumper off another distracted by the lights, the noise, all the things that are around us. And I think that that is one of the most important things that Agile can help any one of us with. 
and it's why I use it as well in my teaching. Maria, if you're a person who is wanting to apply this in their own life, what would you say is the first step that they should take? The first step is really to take the time to pause and reflect and ask yourself what really matters and just take a moment to get clarity around that. And so what we recommend is you pick the top three to four things, a holistic view of everything. So this could be related to your job, career, your business. It could be related to health, family, relationships. It could be a, a hobby or a, just some random thing you've always wanted to do. And so when you start to think about what really matters, the challenge we run into is that if everything matters, then nothing matters. If we're so busy doing all the things or if we're not even able to visualize what we're spending our time on, then chances are you're not necessarily going to, to get to where you really wanna be. You might get an inch of progress in multiple areas, but not a mile of progress in any one area. So what we say is like, start by looking at, if you're not sure what really matters, then look at what we call the breadcrumb trail. What are the things you did last week? What about the last month? And you, there's clues in like your, your phone and your, who did you talk to? What was on your calendar? What did you do? Um, what did you mark done if you're, you're tracking your work? And are those things that you did, if you carbon copy last week forward to the next week and the week after that and the month, if you take last year and carbon copy that to this year, would you be satisfied with that growth, that progress toward those goals? And most often people say, well, no, I, I didn't make any kind of any way near the progress that I had hoped to. And so it's through what, what Agile pro provides is it provides transparency and accountability. So being able to visualize what really matters and be, get clarity on that, without the clarity, it's hard to actually take the steps to get there. And one of my favorite quotes by Lewis Carroll is, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. It doesn't even matter what you do because you didn't have a plan. You didn't have a destination. Yeah, so I talked about this a little bit earlier, but I'm going to discuss it a bit more now. And that is this whole idea of living a pinball life. And I think I'll do a whole episode in the future on this because I think this concept is so important. Too many of us are falling into this trap that I discussed earlier. We are focusing so much on what appears to be urgent that we're not focusing on what is most important. So just like a pinball, we go about our days without intentionality. We sit there and we bounce off one bumper, hit a target, go up a ramp. But just like a pinball machine, no ball will ever do the same path, just like no life will ever lead the same path either. And like a pinball machine, our life is filled with so many distractions. And they're just getting worse as this all digital future surrounds us. And we're consumed by technology. We're consumed by distraction. We're consumed by wanting to know all this information that's around us, what people think about us, that we are distracted to the point we can't focus on sticking to the things that matter most. But Maria, you have managed to figure this out and you have talked to literally thousands around the world and inspired so many. So what is your life like now compared to what it was like before? And how does that feel for you? You know, I think that before I began my journey into entrepreneurship, I was, I've always been like a high performing overachiever, like always wanting to do my best at things, uh, you know, dash of perfectionism and OCD, right? And so when you look at, okay, what is it that I want in life? I was like a dreamer without a real destination. So I think back then, like let's rewind 10 years before I started my first business, I was like someone that was hopeful, but someone that was just like trying to figure out what direction do I take, right? So I mean, it's just, just a person that talks about good ideas. Like people talk about good ideas every day, but the difference is who acts on them. The people that act on those ideas that make it a reality. I mean, you can have a great conversation that's super insightful. The person who writes it down and publishes the article is the, the leader, right? Is the person that's looked to as someone that has expertise. And so now I think the biggest difference is instead of just being a dreamer, I firmly believe you can achieve anything that you want in this life, anything. And you just have to have clarity on what it is and start to identify the steps to get there and then take those steady steps. And so things like the personal agility system, it's a simple framework to do that. If you have a proven method, a proven system, uh, if you have someone that's done it before that you can just follow in their footsteps of what they've done, the success leaves a trail. And so the difference now is 
instead of just thinking, oh, I wish I had a better life. I'd love to live in the big city. I'd love to live in Chicago. I'd love to travel. Instead of just wishing and talking about it, I actually do it and I do it on a whim at times. And so it's like, I, one of the things that, that happens, a lot of the people around me, um, they're like, they all know Agile and they're all getting certified and like the things that I train, like my friends, my family, they're all like, you know, it's like an occupational hazard as a certification trainer. It's like a lot of the people around you start to learn the methodologies and the frameworks and stuff. And so it's like really kind of neat because now I'm surrounded by other people that are in more alignment. They understand the same methods and the ways of getting things done. The tagline for Scrum is twice the work and half the time. Who doesn't want that? That's why the Fortune 100 companies will pay so much for someone to train that. That's why there's only a couple hundred trainers in the world that are certified to teach that on to actually maintain the integrity of the quality of the, that training. And so like the biggest difference now is not only have I done this for myself, but I'm starting to do it for other people. So like all the people around me, it's, it's almost like my friend Sharon, uh, she's become a good friend over the years. Um, she just says, Maria, everything you touch turns to gold. And so like when I'm talking to people, I'm like, Ooh, I see opportunity to opportunity here and there with Sharon. I showed her how to use personal agility. She went from working five jobs and barely getting by to clearing over six figures the first year in business with her dream job. Then she landed a six figure client at the beginning of last year. So it's like, wow, okay, let's like twice the work in half the time, twice the results in half the time, right? And so like, that's what Agile does. So instead of me just like talking and thinking and wishing, the difference now is that I take action, I do and I create the results. There's empirical evidence you can see of, whoa, that's pretty cool. And if someone's willing to put in the work, willing to learn, they can do it too. Anybody can do this stuff. You just have to have the clarity on what you want and then have the consistency in the follow through. And it, it can be that easy. It's funny that you bring that up. And I think Sharon is a great example and she'd be a great guest. In fact, I need to get her on this podcast. And I recently wrote an article and I've got an upcoming podcast on the topic of becoming a visionary arsonist. And I want to just touch on this a little bit for the listeners out there. What I mean by this is we have visions for ourselves. We have visions in the businesses that we may run. And we become such an arson to our own passion journeys. It's unbelievable. And let me give you an example of this. How many of you out there create an idea and give it to your team and they start working on it? And then out of nowhere, you change scope. You change it again. You add new inputs to it. You go to another meeting and you derail it because you see something and you want to make changes. And what should have taken you know, two weeks or three weeks all of a sudden becomes two months or three months. That is a great example of what it means to be a visionary arsonist. We get in our own way and arson our own lives and livelihoods. And I think your example of Sharon is a great one because you gave her the tools that she stopped being an arsonist in her own life. And she took control. And instead of working four or five jobs to get by, she took her life back. She got direction and she made a change for the better. And she went on this path to become the culinary queen. And since then, her life has changed drastically. And I applaud you so much for what you've done in her life. But being a personal agility coach isn't the only thing you do. I remember walking downtown a few years ago and out in front of one of my favorite establishments, you were there with this huge DJ setup. And that's when I realized you are also a world renowned DJ. And I wanted to hear that whole story. And I'm sure the audience wants to too, of how in the world did you find yourself becoming this global DJ globe trotter and being such an amazing DJ in the midst of everything else that you do? Such a good question, John. So I, I find, I kind of um, had an opportunity to come across my path. I was speaking at a conference in Philly five years ago and they didn't have any music entertainment. The people coordinating the event, they ran out of budget. They just didn't coordinate a networking event. And a friend of mine was putting on the conference. It was the heart of Agile Conference in Philly. And Alistair Coburn, one of the co-authors of the Agile Manifesto, uh, he was like, he came to my friend Nick and I, well, because we were sponsoring the event as the Agile Marketing Academy. I was speaking about Agile Marketing. Um, and he's like, guys, th there must be music. There must be dancing. There must be some kind of networking event. Or else it was like the first year they did that conference. He's like, otherwise people are not going to remember it as a fun conference. Like that's where the magic happens. That's where people network and talk and connect. And that's where they, you know, 
it's it's a it's like make or break right and so he was like hey nick can you and maria like dj or something now nick had been he had used to run a creative incubator in chicago so right. he said if you ever run an event space uh, at some point you're gonna have to learn how to dj because at some point the dj is not going to turn up you got to figure out how to move, use the equipment right and so he's like hey maria you want to dj and i was like yes okay i don't know i've never done it before i literally had kept come off of seven days of back-to-back -back training across three cities so one was in one of the suburbs of Chicago. It was like three days agile, like sales training. Um, then downtown in the city, a two-day class, flew out that night, arrived in DC the next morning, taught another two-day class, and then drove. I actually flew uh, one of my assistants up to meet me, and uh, we then drove from DC up to Philly for the conference. And so I literally was back-to-back -back events right before the event, but I was like, this sounds kind of fun. So the first thing I did, John, was I created the DJ flyer because I thought that was important. And so Nick's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, if we're going to DJ, we need a flyer, right? And I mean, the, the design quality on this flyer was so good. I mean, back to the marketing roots, right? Like people like, I, I DJed the first time at this event and I, it was kind of nerve wracking because there were a couple hundred people there and I'd never really done it before. But I, Nick taught me the basics. I knew enough. And then we, he got us a standing gig in the warehouse district of St. Pete here in Florida. And so then we were DJing an open mic night. And so after that, I was traveling and I happened to be in Singapore at a conference. The conference organizers were there and there was another event in Munich, Germany two weeks later. And I had to stop and speak at a conference in Portugal in between. And I was like, you guys are going to get a kick out of this. And I showed them the DJ flyer. I was like, you're not going to believe this. And they saw it and it was like, the heart of Agile, a night outside IT, right? It's sponsored, brought to you by the Agile Marketing Academy. And so they're like, this is amazing. Do you want to DJ in Munich? I was like, well, don't play with my emotions like that, but yes. And so I didn't have any of the gear. Nick had it all here in Florida. I went out into the streets of Munich, Germany. I found a music store, bought all new DJ gear. And I was just like ready. Preparations meets opportunity. I get to the event and they're like, uh, Maria, we we have been planning this event for a year. No, you can't just come DJ. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, they told me I might be able to. Uh, two nights later, uh, the IBM was sponsoring a conference. There's 750 people there. They were sponsoring a networking event on Tuesday and there was no music. And the PR girl comes running up and she's like, Maria, there's no music. And I'm like, so? She's like, you can DJ. If you can figure out how to work up the AV equipment, you can DJ. I had no idea how to hook up the AV equipment. The way we did it, I got on the mic. I was like, does anyone here know how to hook up the AV? Some guy comes over. We rigged it through a wireless mic is how we got it to go throughout the oh entire goodness. room. And I think that this just goes to show it's preparation meets opportunity. So I discovered I loved it. And I've now DJed all around the world from Fiji to New Zealand to Paris to cruise ships and, and launched an international DJ career. And you know what's funny, John? All I did is applied Agile to do that. And so I have a whole presentation, how I launched an international DJ career using Agile marketing. It's just the Agile techniques work. You can literally apply it to anything. You can apply it to your life. You can apply it to launching a product to market. You can launch, it, uh, launch a DJ career apparently. And so it's one of those things where Agile just works no matter where you apply it, it's effective. That is a great story. But at this point in the interview, I wanted to ask you, because I'm sure the listeners want to know, if people want to get in touch with you, Maria, where can they go to learn more about you? And I'll also put information about this in the show notes so that they can find you there too. So you can connect with me if you go to findmaria.com. You can then find a link to all my social media uh, and all the information um, to get you through to my website to find more information on Agile, Agile Marketing, Personal Agility. So Maria, that is really great. And I do have to say with your marketing experience, you certainly know how to take marketing to the next level. And I remember this day, it was a summer a few years ago, and we were on top of your apartment complex with a group of friends and suddenly you disappeared. And then all of a sudden you reappear, but this time in a T-Rex costume. And you made such a splash. There were people all around you. There are pictures all over social media. I could not believe you had the courage to pull that off. So can you tell the audience about that experience and why you use things like this T-Rex moment to help launch your marketing initiatives? You know, so yeah, the, the giant inflatable T-Rexes, I, I adore them. I think they're amazing. I think they're hysterical. 
Uh, you know, John, I, you know, if you've ever studied like NLP, neuro linguistic programming, there's this concept of the pattern interrupt, right? So can you interrupt the pattern of what's happening in life so people stop and they reflect or they see things differently? And so I think really, I have a lot of shenanigans. If you connect, uh, look on my YouTube channel, Maria Mattarelli, um, there's a lot of shenanigans. There's like, I've done Harlem shakes in Istanbul, Panama. Um, I've done um, uh, the, the mannequin challenge in India. Like, I mean, there's just like so many shenanigans. Um, I really think like life is about living and my motto is to help people work better and live better. And so you can apply agile techniques to all of that, but I think it's also important to have fun while doing it. And there's a new concept that um, we're putting together um, a couple of people that I work with, uh, Mark Lombardi Nelson, Alistair Coburn, Joe Justice, and we're, we're calling it permission to play. So in our agile training classes, corporate training, we actually have to do a product simulation. So um, over the years, it gets boring doing the same class over and over and the same simulation over and over. So at one point we started writing like poems, agile poems and blog posts. And then we started writing agile rap songs. And so what's interesting is by the end of the first day, when we're doing the project simulation, just to see how the scrum, the flow works, it's like, okay, now we're gonna write uh, an agile song or poem uh, according to this topic. Here's the parameters and the acceptance criteria. Oh, by the way, rap songs are highly encouraged. And what we started to discover is that when you give people permission to play and have fun, they show up in a whole different way. You wanna talk about passion struck and tapping into passion? Well, people don't wanna just go through the motions every day. They don't wanna just be a cog in the wheel at a company. So the whole idea is how can you tap into that passion and let people know it's okay to play, it's okay to have fun. That's where innovation comes from. That's where true engagement comes from, right? And so my shenanigans are a little ridiculous if you follow me on online and my social media. And it's because I think that it's okay to have fun. And if you can get in a giant T-Rex costume and run around, like people, that, that could make someone's day. They're gonna remember that. I've actually done that at conferences before. It's a big hit. Uh, but you know, it's about, you don't need to take life too seriously. Like, what do you want? Get clarity on it. Take the steps to do it. Find a proven method or system. This is one framework. There, that doesn't work for you, find another, right? Like what resonates with you? So I think it's just important to have fun along the journey. Because if you just hit the destination, it's like all or nothing. Was this the thing that was going to give me full happiness or not? I was in a meeting with one of our global ambassadors for the Personal Agility Institute. We're launching training in Australia. And I shot off my money gun at the end of the meeting yesterday. Like when we had our next call, she was just like, Maria, that like, I was telling my husband about that. That was so funny. Like, that was great. Like, and so I mean, like, why not end every meeting or interview with a money gun? I mean, that's not going to hurt anything. And so a friend of mine got me this money gun with my face on it. So it's like, why can't oh you live the way you want to live? You can. So I just want people to know it's okay to, to tap into that passion and give people permission to play. And you might be surprised at the outcome that it's greater than you ever thought it could be. Well, that was amazing. And how do I not end it when you bring out a money gun? What a great ending to this incredible episode. And I am so thankful that you joined us here today, Maria. Thank you so much for joining. And I am ecstatic to have had the opportunity to do this with you. Appreciate it. Great to be here. What an amazing episode with Maria today. I so hope you found that as enlightening as I did. And boy, did she have a lot to share from how to apply Agile in your own life to her story of how she found her passion and the obstacles she had to overcome. I really appreciate you watching and listening to this show. And until next time, let's get igniting. Thank you so much for joining us. The purpose of our show is to make passion go viral. And we do that by sharing with you the knowledge and skills that you need to unlock your hidden potential. If you want to hear more, Please subscribe to the Passion Struck Podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts at. And if you absolutely love this episode, we'd appreciate a five-star rating on iTunes and you sharing it with three of your most growth-minded friends so they can post it as well to their social accounts and help us grow our Passion Struck community. If you'd like to learn more about the show and our mission, you can go to passionstruck.com where you can sign up for our, our newsletter, look at our tools, and also download the show notes for today's episode. Additionally, you can listen to us every Tuesday and Friday for even more inspiring content. And remember, make a choice, work hard, and step into your sharp edges. Thank you again for joining us.